and then I rotate the velocity field by 45 degrees, it did the same thing as I first rotate the velocity field by 45 degrees and then scale it by two. So going through the top right route leads to the same result as going to the bottom left route. So if a function satisfies this kind of condition, we we'll say the function is equivalent with respect to this particular group. Any questions? Okay, great. So now this is the, the function that we're talking about general mathematical functions. But then when we think about deep learning, how can we build symmetries into deep neural networks? And that's basically the idea behind word sharing in deep neural network architecture design. So we are all familiar with one type of deep neural network, which is convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network has achieved a significant success in deep learning, especially for spatial data like image classification, segmentation. Um, the reason CNNs are so successful is that it actually explores the, the symmetry in the spatial data, uh, which means if I have a spatial data in the form of an image, in this case, we have this array of pixels, then when we consider the group as a translation group, the way CNN design its weights is basically assume that this weights within this orange block are completely trainable. So they are free parameters, they're trainable. However, the block diagonals cross these orange blocks, they are shared. So in other words, if I move the pixels from top, top left corner, it should have the same type of filter parameters as the blocks in the bottom right corner. So if a neural network satisfies this kind of weight sharing scheme, then this neural network will preserve, preserve the translation switch, which is then achieved by CNNs. So we can see that this type of bundles connecting the dots. So these bundles represent the weight parameters in the neural network. And then each of the lines within the bundles, they are all different. They can be different because they turn by gradient descent. But then the two sets of bundles are completely the same. So they are copying each other. The other way to interpret CNN is you can think about it as a filter that moves around the space of data and extracts the features. So the high level idea of building symmetry into the neural network draws inspiration from this architecture, which we want to generalize the web sharing scheme from simply the translation group to all other type of groups. Um, and there is a very beautiful theory by um, Weiler and Zeta, which gave the sufficient and necessary condition for a convolutional network to be equivalent with respect to any group. So this theorem says that if I look at a convolutional layer, and this convolutional layer is G equivalent, if and only if the kernel satisfies this type of condition. So if we look at the kernel uh, over the velocity field V, then when we multiply the inverse of the group permutation on the left hand side, and then right multiply by the same group, but different representation on the right hand side, if the output of this kernel stays unchanged, then this group um, convolutional layer is G equivalent. So in mathematics, this property is called group invariance on the conjugation. So in, in essence, we wanted to give a particular kernel in a convolutional layer. And if we know what the group that we wanted to encode uh, as a symmetry group, then we just need to compute the right and the left representation for that group, and then design the corresponding weight sharing schemes in similarly as in CNNs, then we will be able to encode symmetries directly into neural network. So this whole field of study in machine learning is called equivalence methods. Um, and recently it has attracted significant amount of attention. There was even a tutorial at Europe about equivalent neural networks and groups. Any questions? Okay, 
we need to have some models to do that together to have the all type of population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can do that. Yeah, so they're basically same idea, but just you know, different rules, but each of these are separate. Okay, any other questions? Is there any relation between these uh, two action types? So, in and for all? Yeah. For any, for any action type, or if there's some restriction on that? Um, so, it, it can, well, the, basically, it is defined by what you want to do, right? Then you need to come up with a good reputation. The, the constraint or the restriction is that it has to, it has to satisfy this condition. Oh, so essentially, it was that to solve the resistance. Okay. Um, so now I wanted to just uh, follow this general pipeline and tell you some work from my group of how we can design upper barrier networks for dynamic systems. So uh, this work, right, is essentially led by my PhD student and postdoc. Robin is now at the system professor at the Um, So the problem that we want to tackle. This is something that you guys are familiar with, and I love seeing the turbulent movement. And uh, um, and we know that. Can you? Can for this project, actually come from our previous Joanne Candy. Yeah. models for turbulent simulation. Um, and if I look at the DPA as I make the same prediction and numerical method, but much faster. But what we realized that is after we develop the surrogate model, and as we did our work to domain handling, like experts in mechanical engineering and turbulent simulation, uh, I will always ask by the question, like, does your model generalize if I change the initial condition or boundary condition of the system parameters? Does your model still work? So that actually bugged me for a long time because at the time our method didn't work for a different system. And in this work, we try to generalize where we wanted to have a model that can actually work for different skills of the system with the same parameters and techniques. And then that is where symmetry comes in because when we look at the turbulence at different skills, for example, when we get a copy tune, right? And when we look at uh, the milk in a copy and we see the edits in, in the small scale, and then one of the applications are like focus on climate science. And when we look at climate science, especially this type of cloud resolving processes, and they have large scale edges or turbulence on, on those earth surface. But even though they're at very different scales, they actually can have some similarities. And this is called scale symmetry or sub similarity in turbulence. So, how can we build CNN that have scale equivariance, scale symmetry? Well, we know that regular CNN doesn't have this type of property because CNN only shares weights across different translation groups. So if in order to generalize CNNs for scaling groups, we actually have to translate and scale the kernel at the same time. Um, so that basically leads to skill equivariant convolution, which we designed in this paper. Uh, actually, in this paper, we look at various symmetries from different differential equations. For example, now we still equation that's by seven different types of symmetry. So we give examples for each of these seven symmetries in our paper. And here I'm just using skill symmetry as an example. Okay, so how can we design? Um, Skill equivalent uh, neural network for turbulence. Well, we have to look at the physical systems. For example, when we, when we look at 2D non viscosity equations, we know they're governed by the sense of freedom derived from Newton's laws. And then we can basically define what we mean by symmetry when we look at differential systems. Essentially, a differential system will have symmetry if the solution after transformation is still a solution. So if we have this kind of differential operator, which means we can have you know, first order, second order, etc., cetera, as a differential system, and then if phi is the solution of this differential system, then when we transform the solution, 
uh, by a bloom transformation, if this solution is still satisfied in half of equation, so we can plug this solution into the fact of the equation. And if it's still satisfied, then we say that this equation have this particular symmetry with respect to the loop G. So according to this definition, we can have we can basically have all the list of symmetries for the performance associated with them. We we'll look at this type of data, and this is actually the two different type of connection. Um, and when we look at the symmetries of the number source equation, we can have space, time, uniform motion, reflection, scaling. Um, because here I'm focusing on scaling, let's look at the scaling symmetry. Right, so what's interesting about turbulent scaling symmetry is that it satisfies this half time quarter, uh, quarter time, uh, half space quarter time law. So, so lambda is a coefficient of scaling. And then when we scale the space x by lambda, the time actually has to be square, uh, scaled by lambda squared. So uh, therefore, turbulent scaling have this interesting phenomenon of uh, half space quarter time scaling law. So we can actually exploit this type of scaling law when we design equivalent neural networks. Right? In other words, we can plug this scaling law into our um, equivalent transformations. Um, and that will give us guidance on how we design the kernels in CNS. So this is what we did. So given the velocity field uh, for this mystic, we have a Eulerian simulation of a gradient Bernard convection. And then we will upscale the velocity field by different factors. But scaling group, the continuous group here, we are taking this gradient. So we discretize the scale of different order. And then within each of the block, then these weights are pretty trainable. So similarly to a regular CNN, the, the solid edge lines, they are pretty trainable weights. However, across these different scales, the weights are shared. Uh, but we actually have to account for the scaling operator, and that basically leads to this type of formula. So the physical scaling coming from the resource equation, this scaling operator is actually the actual scaling law of the resource equation. So we can use the number source scaling law, plug that into the, the, the operator in the convolutional kernel, um, and this will give us the feature map. V of P at the output of CNN, which are scale operators. Um, so here we need to basically sum over all the different scales. So lambda will take integer values um, because we're dealing with uh, these kind of pixels. Um, and then we will find this kind of convolution, compute this kind of convolution with K the kernel. But then we need to scale this kernel according to the scaling law of the associations. Um, any questions? So what is the, 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 the comment on the size of uh, lambda and the domain that you model here? So can, can, can lambda be larger than the domain, especially for algebraic meter domain size, right? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, so our, our lambda is relatively small right now. It's smaller than the So um, I think we may use uh, maybe up to 32 on scaling. Um, and the computation also will be possible when we implement the scaling. Uh, Operator is uh, actually like a deep learning, um, a deep learning framework. So we basically have to compute. Um, so in implementation, we actually have to like duplicate all the blocks and scales for different scales. Actually, it takes a long time. So we couldn't do like more than certain um, operators. Yeah. So how about the time scale to for example, the input of the image of the velocity out of the different time? How about the time scale? Yeah, so it will, it will be basically be the same idea. So here, I mean, we're actually looking at a space time scale together. So, so space will just be two p, and the time scale will be another dimension. So when we do that, the space time scale will be three dimensional scale. Does that answer your question? <laughs> we can expect okay, so I can show you some of the results of generalization, right? This is trying to show that if I have a test data that is of different scale than my training data, our previous models, or including more than a lot of the other deep learning surrogate models, or turbulence would fail because these deep learning models don't generalize. 
But then in this case, because the model knows the symmetry in the data, so it automatically applies the, the, the transformation that it has seen um, in the training to the test. So it is actually expected the model will generalize to different skills and test data. So that's what we see. The task here is to emulate the dynamics of ocean currents. So it's basically making forward prediction for the velocity field of ocean currents. So we're using a com combination of simulation and real world data. This is called the a real analysis data. But the less simulated data of ocean current combined simulation and simulations. And uh, in this case, we're looking at you know, the forecasting RMNC versus different absolute factor within the test data. So it measures how different the test data is from the training data. And um, we can see that if we just use a regular ResNet, which is not scale estimated, then as the test data become more and more different from the training data, the error will slow up. But however, for the equivalent neural network, which is aware of the symmetry, then the error stays quite stable. Uh, similarly for the, um, the physical metrics. So in turbulence modeling, there is this important concept called energy cascade or chemical scale. So we can basically measure the energy spectrum uh, of the predicted turbulence versus the theoretical or versus the simulation, the ground truth. Right. So so here we're looking at the physical quantity and how close to the ground truth is. And similarly, we can see that our model performs quite robust when the test data is different from the training data, um, whereas the ResNet will have this issue of generalization. Any questions? Sure. Okay. Going back to the domain, let's just assume what well do we have periodic body connections? Yes, yes, that's the great question. So, so here we're actually just using like adding for like theoretical boundary conditions. Um, it has some like artifacts when we look at actual conditions. So we actually do some sort of engineering tricks to resolve that. Okay, great. Um, so okay, so so far we talked about like the physical system in terms of symmetry in the dimensional equation. Another interest of our lab is uh, transportation. So, so when we look at transportation like this, right? Actually, I think this is probably India. <laughs> so, uh, so, Japanese, India, I mean, similarly in China as well, where I grew up, it is very chaotic. Right? It's a much more complicated fluid flow problem because in this case, we not only need to model the dynamics of the physical system of cars, but we also have to account for the complexity of human psychology. So again, this work um, oh, yes. um, so this work was led by my uh, student and the postdocs again. So so here we're looking at uh, rotation symmetry. And the motivation for we're looking at rotation symmetry is when we look at this kind of intersections. So this is the bird eye view of cars. Um, and each of the dots is a car is a agent. The agent on the road, and then we have this tail which represents the path trajectory of this agent. Um, so, so here we're looking at different agents moving around in this intersection, and we think that well, if we rotate this intersection by 90, uh, 45, uh, 90 degrees in this case, right, then this agent actually should make consistent predictions. So if this agent is making left turn, then it should still make left turn if I you know, rotate the same by 45 degrees, because you know human psychology psychologists know how to do it because we'll move to Australia tomorrow, we we'll still know how to do it, right? Um, and then so this type of rotation symmetry can also be built into your network in a similar fashion, uh, where we, we kind of make an, an analogy that traffic dynamics resembles multi, multi, a driven many particles. So, the driven many particles, there's external force. So, the, actually, the, the energy is not conserved. So, the driven many particle system. Um, and then we hope that to encode this type of rotation symmetry in the vehicle, our models will be able to make realistic and consistent predictions. So, um, we, we leverage on this new technique from deep learning called continuous convolution. So the idea is that if I look at a, a non-Euclidean space, uh, let's say in, in this case, right, on the 
on the left block. So this is from our previous paper where we model a traffic flow in our way. And then here we're looking at, you know, essentially this um, Eulerian formula of fluid. And so we have different sensor stations sit at different conditions, and we just watch how cars pass by. Um, so for that case, we have this type of convolution called the discrete convolution. So we represent the sensors as those in the graph, and then we compute the convolution on top of it by basically aggregating the, the states within the neighborhood. Um, however, when we look at this type of situation on the right hand side, this is a picture from Arbogus, the autonomous vehicle electric company. And, uh, and then we have different agents, so different colors represent different agents. Um, because we're following the trajectory of uh, the vehicle, so this part from the Lagrangian view of the fluid, so we want we follow the trajectory of each particles. So that means a different type of convolution, and this is the idea behind continuous convolution. So continuous convolution will tra track the, tra the trajectory of these cars and then compute the convolution in a formula like this, uh, where Want to show you the equation? Okay. So so okay. So so here in the continuous convolution equation, where we have the feature f of j, so the agent j, so that represents the, the velocity position of this particular agent j, and then k is basically the kernel. Um, so you compute the distance this between uh, agent i and agent j, and then it applies. Basically, this type of kernel to the features, so that's convolution, and we sum over all the neighboring agents for the, the, the agent. So we look at the circles within for this agent I, we sum over all the agents around it, and then we apply the, the convolution, which is actually related to the relative position between these two agents and um, So then here is the scaling factor, which is uh, basically the attention to where these agents are and their relative position is actually uh, the more closer to the agents are, we need to some more things in this continuous convolution formula. Um, so this continuous convolution has actually been quite successful in modeling point cloud data and trajectory data in um, Lagrangian format. But the problem is that it's not rotational accelerity, it's not rotational symmetry. So our contribution is to modify continuous convolution in a non-trivial way to enable symmetry. And, and basically that's due to this new design of the kernel. So we're looking at trajectory with a full coordinate, and you can see that this kernel now is a function over the angle and the radius. So, so we basically compute the kernel, this formula you probably are already familiar with. This is a sufficient and necessary condition for a convolutional network to be good at the variance with respect to this group. But here we're looking at rotation group, and then we need to calculate the input and output representation for the rotation group. So that leads to this kind of uh, wave shear scheme. So we're looking at, let's say, for a particular agent I, then we're looking at all the coordinates of the other neighboring three agents, and then we will divide the space according to the type of uh, coordinate. Um, and then similarly to convolutional wave sharing, where we have wave sharing that is along this orbit, but then the weights along the radii direction are completely terminal. So they are pretty terminal. But the difference is that the, the weights are shared along this radial direction, the, the circular pattern, but they have to be rotated. So they follow a circular shifting ball. Um, and each of these points is corresponding to a filter matrix, that is a weight matrix in the filter, and that's the K. Right, so these weights along the orbit follow a shifting law, and then the only problem here is the, sense, the center of the, the bullseye, which is, has some singularity problems. And for this part, we have to constrain this matrix, which is the filter weight, to be a circular matrix. Um, so interestingly, because we're looking at this type of kernel, which is actually is a, fun, is a, is a function on the circle, Right, and then if we compute the kernel over two circles, and that basically leads to this type of a uh, torus matrix, so the way that shared along orbit. So this is actually the geometric interpretation 
of this kernel is a torus kernel because this kernel k of x takes in this is a, a circle and this is another circle so the prospect of two circles is a torus and then we compute uh, the weight on this kind of torus kernel and then here on the left hand side it corresponds to when i cut this torus open and if i then out it will have this type of shifting ball on the weight of the um, so this is how we deny the equivariant continuous convolution, or we call it echo, and we can apply this type of model to a, a regular synthetic prediction model in, in self-driving cars. So we have the different trajectories from agent, we decode these trajectories using some neural network, um, and then we decode the map information, the multi-agent interactions, the single agent behavior, each of them using our design continuous convolutional kernel. And then we can take this hidden representations, and then going through another set of continuous convolution, uh, eventually generate a prediction, in this case, the delta x, which is the displacement in terms of the image. So then when we make prediction, forward prediction for the trajectories, we just add this with, uh, position displacement to the current prediction, then we can prediction, make predictions of the Western image. So then this part of the model is called the past trajectories. This part of the model, most of the uh, components in the past and the future use our numbers. So, okay, so here's some prediction performances on our real world data. Um, so, we're looking at two benchmark data sets. One is our Uber study, the self driving car companies data, data set, and then a trajectory network is a benchmark that's set for pedestrians. Um, and then here we're looking at the average distance errors of the lower the better. We compare with different set of models. Continuous convolution is our major competitor that is our model without symmetry. And then these two versions of our model have different symmetries, one in the duplex space and one in the uh, hidden space. Um, so we can see that our model has quite a um, reasonable prediction performance. Um, but uh, most importantly, I want to highlight that this model actually have a 95% parameter reduction. So compared with the regular convolution, we use much fewer number of parameters. So this is important because when we deploy this model into the web system, we have limited memory and limited battery. So we want the model to be small, as small as possible. Um, so it actually shows that using symmetry and injective bias, we can basically inject domain knowledge into the model, so the model will have fewer parameters. And more importantly, it can also be fewer in number of examples. So here is the training curve, a learning curve over a number of examples. And then we compare with continuous convolution in group. So we can see that this is the prediction error of validation set. We can see that uh, this model will actually lead to 80% of data reduction because of introducing symmetry as a reductive bias. Can you comment on? I can augment the data for continuous convolution after that, so I can get, I can rotate it manually and get create the ten x more data. Exactly. In, in this case, uh, you are limited by unique data sets because you don't need to rotate it. So, uh, is there so what is the trade off between augmentation? That's, that's a brilliant question. So actually, we did experiments in our paper as well, and there are machine learning people you did augmentation exactly as you described, where uh, they basically rotate the training data by different angles. And add that rotated data into the training set. And then we are comparing with the augmentation, our method is even better than the augmentation. <laughs> and, the, and the one interesting about when you did augmentation, you actually have to rotate according to different angles. And that's actually very difficult for continuous group and also too, because there's a different number of possibilities. Um, and the other trade off is that you actually have to put the computation of cost because you have more data, you have to have more computation. So, so then here we're trying to argue that you don't need to do any of that. So, if your model knows the same thing, then you don't need to do that. Um, I think we're out of time. Yeah, uh, um, so yeah let me just uh, jump, jump to the um. I was going to talk about some new work that is I'm pretty excited about, but it's maybe not of that time. Uh, but I will just show you this video, which is kind of cool. Then you can check out the paper later. <laughs> so, uh, so this video is saying that if I have a model, I can control the model, the learning model, the way that you can synthesize it and have turbulence. So if I have a turbulence of buoyancy factor of nine, then it will simulate this kind of turbulence. I'm not sure why this is not playing. 
Um, right, so the diet is so our model. You can adapt it to different types of buoyancy factors. And then if I change the buoyancy factor to a different number, in this case, 21, it can do similar kind of simulation and, and generate very realistic solutions. So this is something we're very excited about. Um, and it actually uh, advances the symmetry one I talked about that can generalize beyond the group's transformation. So, okay, to conclude, so I talked about some work about introducing symmetry uh, for learning spectral framework dynamics. And then um, I give two examples. One is about uh, aquavariate networks, which is you know, symmetry in the differential systems. Um, we tested on a dissociated thing. And the other one is symmetry in real world trajectories. So we tested on common strategy symmetry condition for pedestrian, et cetera. And in the future, we're very interested in this line of work. We have some new work about automatically the discovery of symmetry from data. Um, and then modeling uh, approximate algorithms when the symmetry is not perfect. So uh, uh, if you are interested, right, we're always looking for collaborative and students. Um, so you can check out the data and the code on my website or follow me on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, here are the funding agencies for supporting this work. Thank you. Um, any quick questions? Yeah. What if you impose symmetry that is non existent? So I have people say, uh, and uh, I have people say, that's why I think there is no symmetry. Yeah, so I mean, that's actually something I've been thinking about for a while. So, so I mean, the work that we did is saying that if I have an underlying symmetry that is not perfect, then I encode that symmetry. I have a model that can actually detect for how much symmetry there is in the data. So this is a new work that we have for the plot symmetry. But if you import a completely wrong symmetry, I think that will actually have this model specification problem. It might hurt the performance, but we haven't tested it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you 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 in the analysis of the training case, you have a different spill in space and time. So the way you do it uh, is a uh, spill of operator spill. Yeah. Uh, we will train the model. Is that kind of same thing as spill preserve? Yeah, so, so the equipment actually is actually uh, programmed into the forward path of the model. So it's trained together. Or like, like, you mean like the scaling operator? It, it's part of the operator. Or you just say, let's say your model. Yeah, it's part of the model. Okay. Yeah. I had one quick question. So, so the symmetry groups are not dimension agnostic, right? So, how do you go from 2D to 3D? Uh, do you have to do anything special? Um, well, for, from, from 2D to 3D, then, yeah, the, the group the, the, is high dimensional, that's right. what you do. Then right. we have to, just, just, I mean, similarly, wish shares can still be used, but we just need to take care of the, how the number of, like, for example, the number of possible scales, like, like rotation wise, you know, the number of slices becomes much higher. Right. So we need to take care of the computational health. Cool. Awesome. Let's thank you. All right. So next we have. Uh, Oh. <laughs> okay, let's uh, take a quick five minute break and then we can start. <laughs> Sorry? We can start at 10 o'clock. So, I'm not going to